Let's get started because we are really happy to have the opportunity to talk with you all about uh, advanced care planning and palliative care for kids and uh, the role that non-palliative care pediatric practitioners have in caring for kids with lifespan limiting conditions. Okay. I have come to that point in my career where I actually have something to disclose. <laughs> I am a bag-carrying member of Courageous Parents Network um, and have been hired by Blythe to do some consulting. Otherwise, we have no conflicts. Um, so our, our idea, our vision for this morning um, and the hour that you've given us with you is to talk about the range of parental emotions that come with a, a company, a lifespan limiting diagnosis in a child, um, to appreciate the central role that you, as a primary care uh, physician, play in that family's journey and the experience they have, um, to talk and identify, to talk about and identify palliative care skills and, a, and of the advanced care planning process um, as interventions to support and guide families, and also to learn a little bit about Courageous Parents Network which I am the founder and executive director of. Um, Pat is an advisor to and has done some work with as a resource that can help you with families. It's sort of a, it's, it's a supplementary thing to augment the support that you provide families. So we're going to start with a video. This is from Courageous Parents Network. We're a web and mobile platform. All of our content is available online. Um, the centerpiece being lots and lots of videos of families talking about their experience and also medical providers um, talking about how they support families. And this is a sample of one of those, which is all about um, parents talking about how they heard and experienced the diagnosis. Just chaos. You feel like your whole world is caving in on you. You don't know what to think. You don't know what to say. You don't, all I'm thinking, I should take another prom. I should have done her hair. And now she's going to die. I won't have a wedding. I won't walk her down the aisle. I mean, just everything just flashes all at the same time. And you don't know. You don't know what to think at that moment. Well, I think it's safe to say that we were devastated and shocked. And um, it's hard to look at something a living being that is as beautiful as a five and a half month old child and realize that she's going to die sometime in the next two years. You go home and you're in denial for a very long time. And, and then you think that there's no way that you as parents cannot make the situation better. My life changed after receiving the initial diagnosis just by trying to get over over the shock and then trying to learn about the future too. Kind of took it as a day-by-day -day step, I guess, and in that aspect of how it changed. You, you don't know what the future holds, and so just kind of living in the moment and day-to-day. -day. You're thinking it's like a bad dream that, that, that it can't be because um, my child was born normal. He was born healthy. And for me to get a diagnosis that he wasn't going to live very long was just, it was unbearable. I went and researched and researched and said, nope, they're lying to me. I will, I will make it better. I'm going to fix this. Um, but you're in denial for a very long time before you learn to accept the new way of life. The thing was, is that, okay, our son has a terminal illness, but he didn't look like it. He could still crawl, he could still do things, he could still eat, he could still do all the normal things. So it wasn't, it wasn't apparent, even though he had been declining, but it wasn't something you could look at and say, yeah, it looks like he's dying. Um, so for me, I just kept going to work every day and, and um, deep down inside, you know, there was that pit. When a child has a life-threatening or life-limiting diagnosis, it, with that come all of these concerns and dreads that parents have because as parents we are programmed to provide exceptional care to our children and see them through to a healthy adulthood and all of that as you heard these parents say in that video is thrown into question and at, at really in jeopardy when 
your child has a condition over which you have absolutely no control. And um, in my work with Courageous Parents Network and in the literature and what Pat has seen herself in personal practice, this is, these are a handful of the things that parents uh, worry about. Um, fear of decisional regret, um, that's a very big one. Fear of suffering, certainly their child's, but also their own. Um, the grief that comes with anticipating their child's death. Um, concern for the other children in the family, siblings. It's, it's a really, really, really big one. And of course, fear, fear of failing their child. Um, some of you may be familiar with the work of Pamela Hines. Uh, she's a nurse and she's done a lot of work with parents of cancer. And she has uh, talks about the notion of being a good parent. Now, every parent, regardless, of their child's situation wants to be the best parent they can be. The stakes are really high when your child is sick and you're gonna to have to make a lot of decisions that inform their care and their outcome. And I will also say from my own personal experience, um, my daughter, I didn't introduce myself, but my second daughter, Cameron, um, had infantile Tay-Sachs and her primary care physician practiced palliative medicine all the way through and made all the difference in our experience. So that sort of gives me a little bit of, um, you are my favorite audience. <laughs> Primary care pediatricians are my favorite audience. They, I'm quite serious. So we had specialists all over the city, um, but it was really our pediatrician that coordinated her care. And um, I, I'm very thankful that he has a whole child perspective. Um, he didn't see Jessie as just a child with San Filippo. He first saw her as a little girl, um, a child, and that, you know, she did have San Filippo. But um, he continued to, to see her for, you know, well doctor checkups and, um, or well child visits. Um, and, and he was our, our, our first go-to when, when something would come up. And then he would help to refer us to other doctors. So really, he was our biggest support. And I think that you probably recognize from your own practices how more and more children with conditions that we used to think of as fatal are now really living much longer. And we can now kind of collate, gather together a number of the very heterogeneous diagnoses in pediatrics um, that we see in palliative care under this somewhat inelegant, life-threatening, complex, chronic conditions title, LTCCCs. Um, when, you, when you look at it that way, we understand that this population of kids is now really a very significant population. Um, and this is due not only to our advancing technology, but the, I would say, enduring fierce advocacy of, of parents and the availability of home resources that we didn't have before. And these kids do start looking a fair bit like the, um, the geriatric, the frail elders with many comorbidities and many subspecialists. And like them, they, we see that they get many readmissions to hospital in the last year of their life. And they oftentimes die after a prolonged, um, or as the result of a prolonged inpatient admission, oftentimes in the ICU. And as we recognize that to be the fact, then it really becomes clear that advanced care planning, thinking with families beforehand about what's most important to them when we understand where their child's life trajectory is going, that becomes a really vital part of providing the best kind of end-of-life care and part of what the primary pediatrician, the, the, the primary pediatric clinician can provide. So we've tried to place a little bit about the parental perspective, a little bit about the role of the, the primary team here. So um, we thought we'd maybe clarify pediatric palliative care. We, we trip over this word palliative care, but if you can frame it as we're going to help you feel like you've, you're giving your chi child the best life they can possibly have, 
like there and it, and trust me it makes will make all the difference in how you feel about your child's about this experience that is happening in your family and how you feel about the care you helped your child receive and how you will remember this chapter in your family's life that may be a little meta that last piece but by framing it in that way as opposed to focusing on this word palliation and palliative it like what parent wouldn't want that so it's my daughter's primary care pediatrician who was her um, she did have a neurologist who helped with seizure medicine and she did at the very end of her life um, get some visits from a doctor who specialized in pain management and symptom management at the very end of life but with that exception it was her primary care pediatrician who took care of her from diagnosis through end of life she had infantile Tay-Sachs um, he helped her stay at home he helped us help her stay at home for her entire life including through some very nasty seizures um, he helped her die at home which is what we wanted he did medical orders with my husband he did all of this, and for that, I am eternally grateful. So for me, and I think most general pediatricians, the joy of primary care pediatrics um, is the relationships. and the wonderful experience of seeing a pregnant mother deliver and see their child in the flesh and then raise their child. And um, there's a lot. That's a pretty powerful thing to participate in. And sometimes it doesn't work out that the horizon is, is uh, beyond vision, sometimes the horizon creeps up on you. And I think that a primary care pediatrician with all that experience and all that, all, all that depth of relationship is in a special position to help the families in some capacity, either to, to understand what the subspecialists are saying or to help them understand away from the hospitals and the urgency of, of, a, of an acute worsening of disease, um, what they're in it for, what, they, what their hopes are for this. And it seems to me a terrible waste if the primary care doctors are not part of that process. There's just too much that's known and understood and seen that's important to a better resolution that's lost if the primary care pediatricians aren't part of it. So I'm interested in that. I'm interested in encouraging that, and I'm interested in finding ways for, um, for the pediatricians to do, I think, what they, f what they otherwise feel called to do anyway, but often uh, don't feel they have the skills or the credibility to, um, to address. So some of it has to do with understanding communication skills and um, trying to talk about things like prognosis in a different kind of a way other than just um, amount of time that someone will survive, but the quality of the time and where decisions might be, imp be important and where um, if you catch your breath, you might be able to put those decisions aside. Some of it might be clarifying goals and wishes um, in a way that feels um, more authentic and true because it's away from that kind of depersonalized hospital setting. So I don't know that the, that the problem is solved and that the way is clear, but I think that it's a good struggle for, for general pediatrics to be in. It's not that there are a lot of patients that they would have, but when they do have a patient like that, I think rather than feeling that it's beyond their scope of practice, it would be great to think that there's so much that's important that's already in their scope of practice that they can bring to these families and, um, and can contribute. I think fundamentally, it's, it's really about a family assembling a team of people who understand them, who understand what's hard and who understands what their aspirations are. 
and who can see them and be with them in different situations and different emergencies and different points of, you know, of pleasure outside of disease. And uh, I think primary care is part of that. It's a family-centered um, endeavor, um, that it is oftentimes interdisciplinary, that it doesn't uh, involve um, even just physicians, but also nurses, child life, um, respiratory therapists, whoever it is who is helping the family achieve the goals that are most important to them. Um, and it's goal-directed within the context of what seems like achievable what we know and what we don't know about what's going to happen to your child, what becomes most important, what can we, what can we hope for. And palliative care practice is based on the, the um, patient and the family experience. And uh, this, this particular family, Ben's family, I think speaks to that as well. You know, you're the mother, it's your job to feed your child. So it, it's sort of an innate need. You, you start out that way right from day one, right? So you think about it and um, we, we were constantly evaluating whether it was something that was gonna make our lives easier or Ben's life better. And both of those things were important, but we always were sort of putting them in perspective. And I think there were moments where we did question, would it make, as Stuart said, it better for Ben to get a better application of the medicine if he could get it internally. But I, I, do, I did have one experience where a different GI doctor, not Dr. Russell, actually said to me, you know, I said, well, what happens when there's that moment where um, the feeding tube is just keeping Ben alive? And he said to me, well, you're going to just have to choose not to give him any formula because we don't take it out. And, and I said, so you're telling me I, my choice today is I can put a feeding tube in and feed my kid. I, I'm basically the, in control of when my child's going to starve to death is basically what I felt like he was telling me at that moment. And, and Pat, actually, when we got involved with palliative care, and actually a new GI doctor, which was helpful, um, <laughs> We, we got the freedom to think about it in all of those different levels. And she, she dis demystified the fact that, yes, we could take the feeding tube out, but also, yes, oftentimes the body just sort of lets you know the feeds get rejected, and the, it, it, Ben will tell you. So she, but doctors don't go there. They, they, they go right from A to B, and they don't talk about what's in between. They don't talk about... That doctor didn't want to hear me ask that question. What, you're telling me that I basically have to pick when I'm going to starve my kid? That's what you're telling me. And he didn't want to hear that question. But Pat, can, could, palliative care, could hear through it and talk about it medically, talk about it emotionally, talk about the physical changes that Ben's body would go through. That's a lot to put together into one package. And it's so helpful when it's filtered down for you a little bit because your emotions are I don't mind around the topic as I said just because I'm the mother and it's my job we're big and they we were constantly evaluating it I remember talking with you about that and uh, exactly your question um, I have to be the one to decide when he when he starves to death I think you said and um, Another thing I think that palliative care should be doing is to help reframe mm -hmm. things like that. And reframing um, the goal of feeding uh, at, at end of life is different. You're feeding for comfort. Mm -hmm. And if the feeding is not comfortable, you don't feed. And if there, <clears throat> if there is either pleasure or comfort or... Um, visible relaxation with feeding, then, then you do it. But it's because the need for the G-tube changes from extending life to comfort, mm -hmm. to keeping someone comfortable. Mm -hmm. I can't 
can't stress enough how the issue of feeding tubes is a particularly hot topic for families, as Jennifer touches upon. You know, it's your parental, um, parental imperative to feed your children, to nourish your children. And um, in, my, in the community that I'm particularly familiar with, the Tay-Sachs community, um, there is a school of thought that your child has to get a feeding tube because eventually they will start aspirating and then you'll go have a swallow study and after you get the swallow study, obviously you'll get a feeding tube. And one of the things that I have advocated for in this community is you need to think about what you want for your child before you decide to go have a swallow study because you're gonna discover that your child is aspirating and most people, after getting a swallow study, the person will say, and now we will schedule your surgery for feeding tube. And the parent is at that point on a conveyor belt that is very difficult to stop. And what I really talk about with families is you should think very seriously and work with your child's primary care team, whoever that is, about what it is you want before you sign up for that. Um, it's really hard to say no to something after you've been referred to it. Um, you can, of course, um, but it's harder. So I ask families to really reflect. And certainly, obviously, there are some conditions where, it, by of course, it's a no-brainer. But for others, such as infantile Tay-Sachs, it's not a no-brainer. And I really think that part of empowering parents as decision makers is to give them the option and not telling them that they should or have to do anything. So hopefully maybe that um, expands the reasons why you might think of considering a palliative care approach or, or uh, calling a palliative care colleague. Not simply when you say, oh, there's nothing more we can do, but really, even from the point of diagnosis, um, we just learned that your child has a lifespan limiting condition. That's a time when you might think of uh, invoking palliative care when there are symptoms that are interfering with the quality of life, when you recognize that there's just some things that are not gonna get fixed, that's, that's a good time to, to uh, think like a palliative care uh, provider. Um, another time I think that makes a lot of sense, and this will happen in your practices, is when there's a change in health status. You have a child with a chronic condition who's punking along, doing okay, and then who suddenly declines. Priorities for the family are going to change. It happens to all of us. I get sick, suddenly what was so important last week is not that important anymore, and other things become really important. So taking the time at a point where there is a, a change in the inflection of the curve to say, huh, it feels like we're in a new place. What, what's most important to you now? Um, and uh, I think we oftentimes will work as uh, an interpreter between the medical care providers and the family. Here's what the family feels is most important. Let's understand what it is that you have to offer and whether that is going to be concordant with what's most important to them. Uh, and we oftentimes get called when simply the family or the healthcare team would like the space, the kind of hypothetical space to consider goals other than curative without, without having the sense that that means they're giving up. They're, they're simply trying to consider what we've got that might be most helpful for them. So within palliative care, <clears throat> there is the, the um, skill, the, the uh, tool of helping families with advanced care planning. And a pediatric definition of this would be communicating with the patient, if appropriate, the family and the clinician about the values, preferences, and wishes that should guide treatment if, if the patient is unable to speak for themselves, which is oftentimes the case for, for our clientele. Why do we want to consider advanced care planning? Well, because when we do, there are better outcomes. If we continue with business as usual, um, things happen that are not, um, that are expensive, painful, add to suffering, are burdensome, and don't always make any sense. 
So when people have had the chance to think through what's most important to them in the context of a serious illness, there is usually increased um, congruence between the goals of care and the care provided. There's better quality of life, better sense of patient well-being, fewer hospitalizations, more hospice care, better parent and family coping, fewer parental regrets, which I think is really a big point. We know that um, and uh, have heard from parents and have also uh, seen published in the literature that going through this process, although it's complicated and difficult, um, helps parents with one of their most important goals, which is to feel that they have been the parent they need to be in a situation they would have never chosen for their child. It gives them back a sense of control. It gives them um, time to adapt to what's coming down the road and figure out what's really important. It prepares them emotionally. Um, and it may broaden the, the sense of their choices of where their child's end of life can be. Um, would they really rather have their child at home rather than in the hospital? And it can provide information about decision making and the family's values to staff who also want to feel that we are doing the right thing. So we do have some evidence. <laughs> it's not all art. Um, there are some uh, nice, uh, nice studies in the literature specifically for pediatrics, limited much more so than in the adult population. But, and that, but it's growing. Though. But growing. Uh -huh. um, and that really do confirm the importance of, of uh, advanced care planning for decision making, planning, quality of life. Jenny Mack has a lovely article that really supports the, um, the uh, that helps dispel the fear we have that when we share bad news, we take away all hope. And in fact, humans are built to hope. We always hope. Um, and it's good if we can hope within a real, a, a reality-based context. So um, she was able to demonstrate that good, accurate prognostic information does not compromise hope, but rather supports it in the setting of a very poor prognosis. And as it turns out, as your child gets sicker, parents and caregivers want more information, not less information. And teenagers or young adults want to engage. I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Voicing My Choices, which is a, a uh, adolescent and young adult version of, of a, a kind of living will. And um, the young, young people who were engaged in developing that were very eager to have a voice in what happened to their end of life. Thanks. It really came to a head because um, Ben was going to be having surgery. Right. Yeah. Uh, for his for his tooth, and um, I you know that <clears throat> the standard process in that situation is for the anesthesiologist or the surgeon to come and say, um, and whatever other choices you have around his life, if something happens in the OR, dang it, we're doing everything, um, and and to have a more nuanced discussion, um, and happily, I think we had a very yeah. Um, thoughtful anesthesiologist who was part of that discussion, and um, we did. That, so it it opened a territory, a, a box that needed to be opened anyway, mm -hmm. and uh, then the um, the form that we used then uh, was something in Massachusetts. It's called the Comfort Care Form, which is being phased out, but um, for a, a different form. The uh, comfort care form I always think of as insurance um, because it does keep choices open for families. In, in the moment, you may make the decision that's right for that moment, but if you don't have a comfort care form and you were thinking that you did not want um, an intubation or an attempt at restarting the heart to happen, that's out of your hands unless you have a form that allows the pre-hospital personnel to stand down from their standing medical orders. They, ha they have to do what they have to do unless they have a signed form. So you don't have to show it to anybody. 
you know, if in the moment you would like, in fact, absolutely anything that the pre-hospital folks could do to be done, they will do that. Mm -hmm. um, what they won't do is not do that if you don't have the form. So right. I, I typically talk about it as a kind of, let's just keep choices open because it will be clearer to you in the moment mm -hmm. than it might be now. Yeah, and, and that was a good conversation. I was not aware of that form or the process or even that an ambulance personnel wouldn't listen to your, if you conveyed to them that you didn't want your child intubated or whatever, that they actually were, didn't have the authority to let you make that decision. So it was great, and I can, re I can remember pinning it up on my bulletin board upstairs in my office just so that everybody knew where it was should the circumstance arrive. And then I can remember traveling, actually. We went somewhere with Ben, I don't remember where, yeah. but um, and taking it with me um, just so that we had the assurity of, of that being, you know, present with us. Um, and, and again, having the conversation with Pat that says, on that Tuesday, if you need to call the ambulance and you've decided something different or you feel differently, just don't show them the form. And it's, again, it was an empower, it was a way to put the power back on to me. And, and that, that, gave, that gives you some assurance and some comfort in your life when you know that some of it is with, especially when your child has a medical disorder that's so out of your control, right? Because we can't do anything. There aren't even really good drugs or anything. So it was, it was helpful, um, certainly at that stage. And it also got us thinking about the next time and the next time. And we needed to start doing that. I have met um, a lot of families who have been discharged from the hospital with very sick children after a long time in the PICU, for example, without any conversation about medical orders, and then they're home and the family is exposed. And you, my point is don't assume that the specialists in the hospital are doing that because it is entirely likely that they are not having those conversations unless this family has been referred to palliative care in the hospital. But I even know some families that were getting palliative care in the hospital and the palliative care people didn't have these conversations with the family before the family was discharged. This was, these were not Pat's patients. Um, and the, the, the team, at when the family gets home and then something bad happens, and the people who are called to the house, it's a traumatic experience. And you guys as primary care doctors who have a relationship with this family, especially if they have other healthy children, so you're seeing this family, you have an opportunity to check in with them and see if this has been done and to educate them about what orders are and how they're not scary and how they are empowering. So all these good reasons to do it. So how come we don't do such a good job? We know this from both pediatric and adult experience that um, these actual conversations are infrequent. They happen late in the course of disease, um, oftentimes you know, within days to hours of the um, actual death, and that they're limited. Oftentimes the conversations are talking about, well, do you want dopamine or dobutamine? We got ECMO, you don't want ECMO? Okay. They, they are medically based, or the medical Chinese menu based, and not dealing with the things that, that uh, patients and families are in fact expert in, which is, so what's important to you? What are you worried about? What are you hoping for? Um, here's what I worry about, and here's what I hope for, for you. So, um, these, these are um, true obstacles. They're also hard because it's just hard with kids. We don't, um, as Vanessa said, kids don't die, right? Or at least they're not supposed to. We also, I think, as humans, again, live in this sort of superstitious keep the evil spirits at bay um, part of the world where if we name it, it might happen. Um, or it means we're giving up or it means if I name to my clinical team, they might leave me.
because they may feel they have nothing more to do than that actually does sometimes happen. My own experience of naming things is that it brings them back into the realm of this is something we can talk about. It's not so terrifying that it cannot be named. It can be named. There are times when I have said the word die or death and I just see families go, oh God, that has been in the bubble over my head and I have not been able to say that word. Okay, now it opens a space where you can talk about it. There's the um, a palliative care nurse, I know, I mean, this is not original, but she uses the expression name it to tame it. I really like that. Yep. Name it and taming it. Um, we do also, I think, find it hard to have these conversations because particularly in pediatrics, our prognostic certainty is really limited. Um, you know, we have kids with conditions that uh, um, used to be quite short-lived and now with increasing technology and availability, live much longer. It's um, oftentimes much more like the adult with congestive heart failure where every hospitalization, 50-50, whether you make it out, but you go home and then you have seven more hospitalizations where it's 50-50, whether you make it out, just at a declining level. So that prognostic uncertainty sometimes makes us hold off on having these conversations. We have to deal with our own clinical biases that says, um, you know, if, if my patient dies, I have failed. And, and that's our, our struggle. Um, and also as, as pediatric providers, we just don't get an opportunity. I don't know how many of you have had to um, face caring for a child in, in the primary care practice um, who has died. But for primary care pediatricians, it's not a common event. Here's the problem that I experience a lot of the time. You know, I mentioned that we are hopeful critters as, as humans. And all of us are on a swing of more realistic hopes to less realistic hopes. And that's actually healthy and human and normal um, to, to have hopes that do or don't quite match up with reality. The only trouble is it's really confusing for us. You know, when, when the parent we just had an in-depth conversation about prognosis with says, well, and I hope that next July we'll do something that doesn't fit into what I just told them. It's because they're swinging. So it's really confusing for us unless we recognize that that is, in fact, what happens. People continue to have hopes. And I, I, would, I would add to that that if, if, you've had, if you've had the conversation with a family and you do feel like they're hearing you, and then a week later they're talking about next summer or when Bobby goes to college, that doesn't mean that they didn't hear you and they've forgotten. They're just in that moment in, in a different place. And it is not your job to remind them that last week they were accepting the fact that it was likely Bobby was going to die. They know that. They're just in the moment that you're now in, they're thinking about something else. But you don't have to hammer it in if they, you feel like they've lost the thread. They probably haven't. They're just in that moment in a different place. I um, recognize as one of the primary coping skills of families with a child with a lifespan limiting condition is living in the moment. And living in the moment makes it really hard to, uh, to do advanced care planning. Um, but I also hear from both of you as you're describing the conversations you have, that the valuable tool you already have, which is simply to be curious and, and, and not prescriptive, but curious. How are you doing this? What's happening with the kids? If you had to make tough decisions, how is it that you make those decisions? What are the ways that you do that? So it's really being curious, caring, a caring curiosity, I think, is, is what I would say. And um, I think you may find some of the, the um, tools that are evolving now in terms of questions and, and a, a kind of a script to be helpful. So how do you figure out which families? I mean, obviously, some of them 
um, are easy to identify. One uh, tool that has been used a lot in the adult world and uh, for actually for prognosis as well as for identifying palliative care needs is, would I be surprised if this person died in the next year? Um, and, and that helps identify a population of kids um, for whom this kind of advanced care planning discussion might very well be beneficial. Might not be possible, but might be beneficial. Um, in the adult world, it's actually a surprisingly accurate prognostic tool. Um, people for whom the answer is no, I'm not surprised, are about five to seven times more likely to die in the year than people for whom the answer is yes. That's not the case in pediatrics. So no prognostic uh, value to the surprise question, at least in my experience, but um, a very useful question in your own mind as you go through the Rolodex of uh, patients in your practice to say, oh, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if this little one did. Other triggers for thinking about advanced care planning, there may be disease-specific um, triggers that are uh, specific by diagnosis or by milestone. So for instance, uh, um, almost any condition with two or three hyphenated names, okay, that's a diagnosis. Um, uh, milestones like the, the child with CF who now is um, home on oxygen, that's a milestone in the disease. I think home nursing needs is a little flag for us, um, dependence on technology. Uh, any diagnosis that, that implies that the child may not survive to independent adulthood. A colleague of mine suggested that those children for whom you are thinking of a make-a-wish trip, they might want some advanced care planning. Um, and for any of your kids who are chronic, um, you can try to normalize it and say, this is what I always do with my kids who have two or more subspecialists every year, along with the immunizations, I schedule some time to think about the big picture. So how do we do this? Well, I think a setup is important, and the one that I just mentioned, normalizing it is one way to do it. Um, <coughs> as in, I do this for all my kids with two or more subspecialists. Um, or uh, at that inflection in the, in the course of disease, feels like we're in a new place, can we take a moment to think about the big picture? Um, and, and to do that in the, in the context of a request asking for permission, um, because uh, families are not always ready for it and they won't always engage. And then you have the opportunity to kind of lean in to sharing your own prognostic information. And we do that with a, a hope and worry statement and a and not but statement. So I hear you're hoping that Ben won't have to use a wheelchair. And I worry that the decline we've seen is going to continue. And what I love about this framing of I, 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 I is you're involving yourself as in the shared decision making as a partner with the parent. So I am worried about your child or I hear you, I'm worried about your child. And you're, re you're removing some of the responsibility from them and putting it onto yourself. I'm worried, now you parent may also be worried, but I'm voicing it so you don't have to. And maybe you say, oh yes, me too. Maybe you the parent says, oh yes, me too. Maybe you the parent don't say, oh yes, me too. But it's been let out. And there's some relief that comes in the releasing of it. I'm not crazy that I'm worrying about this at three in the morning. Mm -hmm. My pediatrician is too. And the, so the language that reinforces that we're in this together, I wish, I wish we didn't have to worry about this. Um, because when you do share these worries, there will be emotion that comes back. Um, there will be anger, denial, sadness, um, fear. And so being able to respond to that emotion is important. Having defined what we share together as the, the uh, shared understanding of what will happen to the child, then you can um, explore really what's important, knowing what we are looking at. And also in pediatrics, we always have to say, and knowing what we don't know, um, because there's so much uncertainty. 
what becomes most important for you or your child and your child and your family. And I often find that may be just too unclear. I find the what if question is, is very helpful. It creates this kind of hypothetical space where it's easier for all of us to examine something. So what if we knew for certain that he was going to have to be in a wheelchair? What would be most important to you then? So not saying, I know for certain he's going to need a wheelchair. You better get on you know, thinking about this. It's saying, what if it was? What would be important? And all of us are just a little more agile in that space than we are when we're having to, to uh, plunk down. So the, ex the exploration can be as simple as that, knowing what we know and don't know what's most important to you. And I just, as a parent who has been through this herself, and as a parent who works with parents um, every day slash week now, I cannot reinforce enough how, how beautifully critical, how beautifully situated you are as primary care pediatricians to make a difference in the lives of these children and their families. Um, I've heard stories of families who have felt abandoned by their pediatrician, which is just another loss and another slight, and leads to fear and anxiety. And then the opposite, which is my own, and then certainly you heard uh, Carrie talk, just and the number of parents who have felt that their primary care pediatrician made a huge difference as the quarterback, as somebody who they trusted, who they understood, and if the child dies and there are other siblings who survive, that is an ongoing relationship that you're going to have with that family. And again, you know, like it just makes a big difference if you can continue to have, a, you know, you build on that. Um, and it's a, I mean, nobody goes into primary care pediatrics to have children die, but you do go into primary care pediatrics to care for families, because that's really, it's not just child care, it's family care, and the family goes on forever. So it's just huge. Thank you for, thank thank you. You for choosing to come here today. <laughs>